How many of you, before you came from home, did some housework? How many of you washed the vessels, washed your clothes, swept the house, cleaned the rooms, the toilets? I can only see a few girls' hands raised. And this is what happens in society, is the gender notion of housework. That housework is only to be done by women, is it? So many of you have been able to come on time, have been able to sit through all these wonderful speakers, are able to pay attention and at ease, and you are sitting at ease. When you return home, you will find that your rooms have been cleaned, the toilets clean, there is food on the table and uh, with all those comforts, you will get a good night's sleep. Who is the person responsible for this comfort? Who has contributed to this comfort? Yes, mother definitely, not the father of course. The mother definitely, but along with the mother is a very important person whom we rarely recognize. That is the domestic worker. The domestic worker who is in the shadows. The domestic worker who is in the shadow. Lots of domestic workers, nearly 3 to 5 crores in this country. This is just an estimated number. They are so invisible, so we cannot get even concrete data. But this, this invisible workforce, the migrant live-in workers as well as the part-time domestic workers are a huge workforce and they are high on the graph of urban women employment. See, take the migrant live-in workers. Let us go on a journey with them. The migrant live-in workers who come, who are almost about two crores in population and about 30% of them are child domestic workers, children below the age of 14. Let us go on to Dashmi. Dashmi, 13 year old Dashmi comes from Jharkhand, from a remote village which is poverty stricken, there is no connectivity, no education, not even a two meals a day. Lured by an auntie with the promise of a job, she was lured to Delhi first and then made to work there for about one and a half years. Bonded labor still exists. She was then taken to Bangalore and worked in the corporate employer's house. And she worked there for one and a half years. After working there for one and a half years, with no communication with anyone, not even with her mother, not allowed to go out, having to work for 16 hours a day. This was a story. In this entire trafficking story, who gains and who loses? The placement agencies who are in the middle of this racket earn a commission of 30,000 per client. At the, at the bottom is Dashmi and people and children like her who are not even paid, who are supposed to be paid and then promised to be paid 2,500 to 3,000 rupees and yet sometimes the money does not reach them, nor does it reach the parents. This is the plight of innumerable girls and, and adults who have been trafficked and brought into the cities as forced labor. Different cities, different upper middle class families, but similar harassment. Harassment of loneliness, harassment of not being able to go out, harassment of verbal abuse, harassment of imprisonment. Dashmi's journey is true for also the lakhs and crores of children and adults who are trafficked on a daily basis for forced labor. You have them coming from, you have them being brought from West Bengal, Siliguri, Orissa, Tamil Nadu and districts of Karnataka. They all come into the glamour of these cities, yet on the one side in the hustle and bustle of the cities are hidden the feelings of these domestic workers. These domestic workers face isolation, loneliness, guilt, fear, helplessness, loss of identity. Can you imagine what it is? to lose your identity. Can you imagine if you are a nowhere child or a nowhere citizen? This is a case for millions of them and Dash, in Dashmi in particular, in a span of three years, also lost what is most precious is language. She could not speak her mother tongue anymore. This is the cultural loss of identity that happens. Then we have the situation in the home where they face innumerable workplace abuse. These tragedies that unfold tell us stories about 
children as young as 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, 15 years, whom we have rescued many a times. And they tell us stories, they tell us their experiences of having been beaten, verbally abused, sexually harassed, raped even, murdered, buried in the same ground, and also of emotional abuse and torture. These are the stories that we may read in the papers. These are the stories that never come out also many times, are caught in the silence of the households in which they work. One such story is that of Shweta, a 13-year-old girl who was forced to go leave her studies because her parents were too poor and uh, leave her studies and join an employer's house in upscale locality in Kumara Park. In this situation, when she went and joined there, she worked for 16 hours a day. She worked for 16 hours a day, was not given much food to eat, had to work from morning to evening in the same, in the same clothes, not much of new clothes given to her. A place to sleep has to be provided to them according to the law, but somewhere she was allowed to sleep in one corner of the balcony, even in the cold winters. Shweta, on the day that the employers had this ritual fasting, like we have in our country, where most, uh, so had, uh, were, were fasting as a ritual, they also ordered Shweta not to eat anything, to go on fast. This little girl, hungry as she was, she went to the kitchen to make some food for herself to eat. Enraged, the employers hit her head against the shoulder, banged her, beat her up, verbally abused her. Helpless, in tears, in humiliation, she walked up to the terrace and in a minute, in a flash of a minute, she had jumped down. She had jumped down from the terrace and died. Who's to answer Shweta's parents? Who's responsible for this loss? In the shadows, again, are the huge segment of this workforce, are the part-time workers. Part-time workers, an estimated number again, that is about 6 lakhs in Karnataka alone. Part-time workers who day in and day out toil in about 7 houses a day. 7 houses in order to make a minimum standard of living. And in these 7 houses, they do not get, in these 7 houses and in, uh, and in all the other many houses that they work in, there is absolutely no facilities, no amenities, no social security. We look at Rukmani Amma. We go along with Rukmani Amma and look at her life. She started at the age of 10, started working at the age of 10. Today she is 70 years old. Her earnings are started as rupees 10 a month. Can you imagine any of you whose pocket money is, is 10 rupees a month? 10 rupees a month to now what is 500 rupees a month in today's day, in today's inflation. This old woman has no social security. There is no pension for any of them. 10, 15 years of their life they give to a household and suddenly one day they are thrown out without any security. The number of tasks that they do are drudgery itself. Many of us who do housework know what it is. Sweeping, cleaning, washing, cooking, taking care of children, taking care of pets, taking care of the house, bathrooms. The list is endless. We all know how much of a drudgery it is if we do it. And in spite of this, day in and day out, they continue with their tasks. And day in and day out, we are able to continue with our lives of going to college, of getting an education, of wearing smart clothes that they have washed, and of having a better life for ourselves. In these cases, in many of these cases, in many of the quarters, in many of the housing complexes, there are workers who are employed on a basis of bonded labor. You may think bonded labor has been abolished, but take in the quarters where women are given a house, a room, a small room at the back of their house, and they are on call, like one of the workers said, that we press the bell, they press the bell, we have to go. They press like this and we have to be there at that time. That is how the employer is showing me. So that means if I sit in the bathroom and the bell is heard, that means I have to get up and go, is it? So they are not given any wages. They are just given that room and as, as much as the transfer takes place, they will have to move. Where will they go? They don't have any cash for their medicals. They don't have any cash for rations. This is the plight of a number of domestic workers in the defense quarters as well as in the government quarters. And uh, this is the extent to which 
bonded labor still continues. Therefore, in spite of their productivity, in spite of their contribution to our lives, in spite of the contribution to our lives, to make our lives comfortable, to see that we can study without being hindered, to see that we can come to college or to work without being hindered, to see that we live comfortably, they give their lives. Their contributions are unrecognized by us and by the government. They contribute to the productivity of the nation. They enable the, the gross domestic product to be realized because they enable us to go to work, so they enable the GDP to be made. Yet, they are a largely unrecognized workforce, not even included in the schedules of the government, not even included in the schedules of the labor department, not even considered as workers. Economies have changed. We have all moved on. Urbanization has taken place. And yet, these workers still live under the servant-master relationship. So in order to get them an identity as workers, they need to be, there needs to be a law for them, there needs to be social security, there needs to be benefits just like all of you, uh, all of you and me, uh, you know, we all get, we all enjoy. We all enjoy an eight hours working day, we all enjoy leave, we all enjoy paid leave, we all enjoy bonuses, we all enjoy allowances but our domestic worker does not. This is the only sector where caste, class and, where caste, class and gender juxtapose so well with each other. Because as much as the SCs and the Dalits are considered the lowest of the low, so also women in this country. And as much as women in this country are degraded and looked down upon, and her work is also degraded and looked down upon. So we have what is called the gender notion of housework. As we all know, in the houses, in your houses, where your mothers do work, where they do housework, where they help, where they do the cooking, where they do the cleaning, where they do the housework, it's not considered a big deal. How many of us have ever said thank you to our mothers for doing that housework? How many have said, it's only the girls again? How, how many have valued, how many have valued the housework that has been done by the mothers at home. In the same way, since this housework is not considered productive, since this housework has not been paid till today, there are some people asking for wages for housework and mothers will one day call for wages for housework. But since this has not been considered as important and has been devalued, since it's been done by women, so also any work done outside the house, which involves cleaning, which involves cooking, which involves washing, is also devalued. So that is why for so many years, domestic workers and their work has been devalued in society and by the government. The labor minister tells us, who are these women? Where are they? What work are they doing? These are his questions when there are five people working in his house, five women working in his house. So with this gendered notion of housework, the devaluation of this work and the devaluation of the woman also continues to take place, thereby making her lo lose her dignity. Sarojima is a worker from JP Nagar, Bengaluru. She asserts herself. She has faced discrimination. She has faced caste discrimination. So she today boldly asks. She's asking all of you, why this untouchability? We have the same blood flowing in our veins. We have the same dreams, hopes, and needs as all of you. Isn't it true? Do they have any different? Do they have horns? Do they have any kind of other dreams? No, they have the same dreams. Yet, what do we do for that? In the case of, uh, in, in, uh, Sarojima further goes on to say that why do you get offended when my child gets education? I toil, I toil hard, I work in seven houses because I want my children to get education and my children to get for, go forward in life. So why do you get offended when my child, on her own merit, gets 76% in, in the boards, and she gets admission into a prestigious college in the city? The employer's child does not. So the employer gets so offended, gets so offended and feels so low, that she dismisses the worker from her workplace, dismisses the worker, sends her out. So this is the kind of pettiness, the kind of discrimination, the kind of jealousy, the kind of uh, relationship that has been built up here. 
So therefore, although the economic relationship may have changed, the feudal relationship still persists where we continue to look down and discriminate them. So how many of us really know how our domestic workers come to work? How far do they travel to work? Sometimes more than 2 kilometers, 3 kilometers, where they come walking, even climbing walls, so that they can come to your house to work on the right time. How many of us know their names? How many of us know their identities, where they stay? What are the kind of houses they live in? Do, do those houses have water? Do they have toilets? Has, has my domestic worker faced violence the day before from an abusive husband? Do we know how many creches are there in the slums where they stay? Because very many times domestic workers tie their children to a cot or else lock their children in the houses because there are no creches in the areas. And they come to our houses to take care of our children. So this is the kind of facilities, identities that these domestic workers have, but we have not bother to find out. Our lives never stop because of their support. We continue to do what we want to do, what we wish to do. We continue to pursue our careers. We continue to pursue our dreams. We are able to attend to our hobbies. We are able to stay back after class, get involved in dance parties. We are able to do all that we like to do. What about them? How many of them and their children are able to follow their dreams? How many of us have ever cared to find out? I know there are very many good employers, but I'm not talking of this as a favor. I'm talking of this as a basic right as a worker and as a human being. So our lives never stop, no matter what. Their lives also never stop. They continue to work, they continue to toil, they continue to uh, labor hard without any rest, without any holidays, without any benefits. So can we make a difference? If this has made an impact on you and you want to make a difference, can we? You think we can? That's a very small difference. Yes, that's like it. So how can we make a difference? Can we acknowledge the workers' contributions? Many people do in our society. There are many employers who do acknowledge who do help them out, who have come with us to police stations, who have come with us to help her when she is in need. I mean, I had a fantastic employer the other day who really went all out of the way to see that this lady is safe, to see that the domestic worker is safe. So we have those people. But yet on the other side, what is frightening is the youth. What is frightening is the survey done among the youth by CMCA, that is uh, Citizens Movement, uh, Children's Movement for Civic Awareness. They did a survey among the youth and the surprising two facts that came out was that 50%, 50% of the youths feel that migrants should not be allowed from other states. Isn't this intolerance? Can we afford to be intolerant in this, in this new age and in this new globalized society? The second fact was that 49% of the youth felt, youth felt that domestic workers have no right to ask for minimum wages or basic facilities. So is it only our privilege? Is it only our rights to ask for that? Do they not have any rights? So the first important thing is to acknowledge the workers' contributions. The second thing that is most important for any human being is dignity and respect. How many of you want dignity in your lives? How many of you want respect? Don't you feel good when you get respect? So it's the same way that is said that if you give respect, you get respect. So it's very important that we bring about respect and equality in this relationship, not that of master and slave, not that of servant and master, but that of a partner. Both are partners in the work, in the house. The, the unfortunate thing or the fortunate thing, I do not know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, but that this work, this is the only work that takes place in another person's house. It's not in a factory, it's not in a strange place, it's in a family. And so what happens is with this kind of work being done in a family, many domestic workers have these feelings of gratitude, loyalty, you know, we have to look after them. In fact, I must narrate to you about this incident. Three children we rescued, six years, 
eight years and ten years, working in a house in Jakur. Three children working in the same house, the youngest was sexually molested. We rescued these children, okay, were coming back to the were coming back from the police station, coming back to the referral center, and but this youngest child, do you know what she said to me? She said, You have taken me away from there. How will the employer, how will the lady of the house cook tonight? How will she have dinner? <coughs> this child, this small child who has been working for them is concerned not about her own life or her own comforts. She was concerned about how will the employer, even though it was an exploitative employer, how will the employer look after, uh, how will the employer make dinner that night? So the feelings of gratitude, loyalty, everything is so attached in this relationship that it becomes very difficult for them also, for us also to segregate it and talk about respect and equality. None of them are doing us a favor, neither are we doing them a favor. Please don't treat this as a favor. We have had many employers who say, look, we gave her a home. Look, we are giving her a nice place to stay. What would have happened if she was in the street? This is all very well, but would you do that for your own daughter? Then adopt her, take her into the house like your own daughter, look after her, give her education. Then I will say that you are looking after her. You are not doing anyone a favor, please. Neither are they doing you a favor. So let us not look at this relationship as that of favors, but as that of rights and equality. Let us open our minds and hearts let us open the windows of our mind to understand and to appreciate and to uh, understand their contributions. Let us enable domestic workers to step out of the shadow. And this you and me can easily do. It is not something big that we have to do. It is not something outside our busy lives that we have to do. All that we have to do to help them out of their shadows is to give them opportunities, to give them alternatives, to help them to enable them to become, to enable them to speak up for themselves, to assert themselves when there's violence. Violence at home, violence in the society, violence in the workplace. So can we enable these domestic workers to come out of the shadow? Can we? Yes. If we do want to and if we can, there's just one request that each one of you can take up is that one is acknowledge your domestic workers' contribution. The other is, if anything happens in your neighborhood, if any such situation, because most of the cases, this girl who's in this uh, uh, slide, this girl is uh, uh, Ashwini who was uh, 16 or 14 years old. She was in an employer's house working and she went up to the terrace to put the clothes on the, to put the clothes in the line. It, uh, the, it, it came in connection with the electric tension wire that was there and immediately she got electrocuted. The employees did nothing. They came back, they went to the government hospital. The government hospital paid le least attention. The girl got gangrene. Her toes and fingers are no more. She cannot have any life in future. Who's to compensate for her? In, when we came to know about it, we went to the police station and try to get her justice. The police behave as if they are above the law. The police behave as if they do not know what the law is. And then we had to struggle a long time in order to get 40,000, 40,000 for a life, 40,000 for a future. So can we enable these workers to come out of the shadow? By that I mean that, can each of you become her voice? Can each of you report about it happening in your neighborhood. That is something that you can do. That is something that all of us should do. It's not could do, should do. As responsible citizens, as responsible human beings. Can you inform us in the neighborhood when these things happen? Because migrant living workers are the most difficult to reach. They are the most difficult to touch and their vulnerability is high. So my appeal to you is that if at all you come across such cases of exploitation, of torture, of beatings, and the child wants to come out, and the adult wants to come out, please inform either us, or the authorities, or somebody at least. Don't keep it a silent secret, don't keep it a secret, as silence is the worst form of violence. The difference between what we do 
and what we could do would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. Thank you.